Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I'm here today to do a Friday Reads video where I wrap up the week in reading and talk about any bookish things that have happened. This is a good week to wrap up a week in reading because I finished five books this week and I'm feeling very smug about that. Yes, one of them I was basically almost done with when I did my last Friday Reads video, which will be linked down below if you'd like to check it out. But it doesn't matter. I finished five books this week, and that, that's a big deal for me. I don't usually finish that many books in a single week. I actually managed to get a lot done this week. But we'll talk about all of that when we get to the actual Friday Reads portion of this video a little bit later. First, just a couple of things to get through to and through before we cover that. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about any of them because, again, there are five books to recap. But so quickly... I want to say thank you, first and foremost, because in my last Friday Reads video, I talked a lot about some stresses and anxieties I was dealing with, probably as a result of some growing pains on my channel, and there has been a sort of outgrowth of negative comments lately, and I, I talked about it, and uh, people were very kind about it. Interestingly, I did not get a single negative comment this last week, and that was nice. That was really necessary. And I don't know if it's because I kind of put that energy out in the world. I don't know if it's because the videos that were attracting it. I shut down uh, comments on two older videos that particularly attract people who want to leave negative comments. And I, I don't know if it's just the content that I posted this week or as opposed to last week. Um, but for whatever reason, there was not a single negative comment on the channel this past week. And that was really nice to see. And uh, I, I'm feeling like I'm in a much better headspace about all of that right now. So thank you for helping me talk through it. Talking through it really was very helpful for me. I did think about it a lot over the weekend because I was trying to think about whether or not I want to change or make changes to the type of content that I put on the channel. Or if maybe I should just post less. And as I thought about it over the weekend, it seems like the natural response is not to put pressure on myself to post as much because traditionally I try to post three videos a week and that's a lot. And one of those videos is a Friday Reads. So I always know what it's going to be. I don't have to plan for it really. But three videos is a lot. And it's kind of funny that I'm saying that this week because this week I actually had plenty of time to do three videos. I did a uh, reaction to Publishers Weekly's best fiction books of 2022. I'll link that down below. And I did a book haul for the month of October, which will also be linked down below. It just so happens that this week, it was a lot less busy with work than it has been. And that's the type of thing you really can't predict. The nature of my full-time job is that I don't know what my days are going to look like. And that's part of why pushing myself to schedule and post three videos a week is a lot. I never know what kind of time I'm going to have to do. So I end up stressing myself to do it. So if my plan was, after thinking about it over the weekend, if I have time to post, film, edit, and post three videos in a week, great. If I don't, not a big deal. I just remove the pressure. Like two videos a week would be fine. And then it just so happened that this week I had time to do three. But that's great. And I just want to make sure I keep in that mindset where if I can't do three, it's fine. And actually, I took a much slower approach to posting those videos. And that was really nice as well. Uh, and I think that also helped because one thing that was stressing me out is that I was not having enough time to keep up with the comments that people were putting on my new videos. And one thing I did differently is... I filmed my Publishers Weekly video, I think on Monday, and then I edited it Tuesday morning, the following day. Usually I try to film, edit, and schedule all on the same day. And I ended up posting that video on Tuesday after I finished editing it. And what was, I noticed about that was I actually had time to respond to all of the comments. Usually I schedule my videos to post early in the morning. Like I'm not even awake when they, they post because that way it's morning on the East Coast. It's still relatively early in the day over in Europe. And by the time I wake up, comments have already accumulated. But it's nice if I post the video while I'm awake, I actually was able to keep up with them. So I learned something and I took a much slower, less stressful approach to processing that video and I, I liked that. And then I was able to do the same thing with my book haul. I filmed it and I did manage to edit that the same day, but I gave myself an entire day 
without it being posted. Like I finished all of that on Wednesday and then I didn't schedule it until Friday morning. And that allowed me to do two things. First, it gave me an entire day to edit the closed captioning for the video. Cause usually when I try to do it all in one day, I can't do that. It just falls out of my to-do list because I, there's just no time to do it all. So I had Thursday to do that. And for the first time in a while, I was able to edit closed captions for my video. And that's something that I do really want to pay attention to because it's really important for accessibility. And I don't want to just not do it. So that was nice. And it also let me experiment with having a premiere. And so this morning I set it for a time when I was just about to be starting my work day. And it was nice. By the time the video was ending, I think 20 people had joined. That, that That's not a whole lot, but honestly, I'm pleased and impressed when anybody, like any amount of person watches any of my videos. So it was nice and we had a good conversation going. So I'll do that again. I don't know if I'll do it for every video, but it was a good experience. Somebody had recommended that I should think about doing premieres and I can't remember who I apologize but I, I think I will definitely do that again. So that's sort of the channel update part. And again, thank you for all of the support. It was very nice. And I will leave it at that. The other thing I wanted to mention before we get to the Friday Reads portion of the video is that supply chain is once again becoming an issue. So if you are going to be purchasing books for yourself or gifts for the holidays, uh, shop early for sure and pre-order books that are not out yet because that way you'll be guaranteed a copy bookstores will know to get you a copy and all of that stuff uh it is not being talked about a lot like it was last year and last year i think it gave people a sense of false hope because a lot of things that people predicted to be issues ended up not being issues because bookstores were able to order a lot in advance it feels like we've we've run into a couple of things that people haven't widely talked about like jeanette mccurdy's book was widely unavailable in print for a while because there just weren't enough copies and it took a really long time to get them reprinted and shipped and all of that stuff. And I have noticed a lot of the time books that I've been interested in have periods where they're temporarily unavailable or back ordered, and it's the nature of the supply chain. So order early, pre-order if the book's not out yet, and you know help your indie if you can um, because obviously that's really important as well. But I, just, I want to put that out there. And one of the reasons I am putting that out there is that I ordered a cookbook for Joel when we got home. It is a cookbook. Um, the husband of somebody we shopped with in Positano uh, works with uh, this guy named Gennaro who works with Jamie Oliver. And I can't remember Gennaro's last name, but he has a cookbook called Limo Gennaro's Limoni. And it's a beautiful cookbook. She didn't sell it in the shop. I thought Jamie was gonna be joining me, so I moved this stuff and now she's just wandering off down the hallway. <laughs> um, point being, we ordered it from Blackwell's when we got home and it has been two weeks and it has not shipped yet. And uh, it seems like that's just a thing. Like that's not even a supply chain issue. That's more of a staffing issue for them. So it's totally fine. We didn't need it for anything, but just heads up, things could take a really long time, so shop early. And I just wanted to mention that because, you know, if you're like me, you like bookish things for the holidays. So think about it a little early is the only thing. Let's move into the actual Friday Reads portion of this video because, again, there are five books to talk about, and Jamie might actually be joining me. She's thinking about it. She's really thinking about it. Here she is. I'm going to hang out with me. <laughs> so... I finished five books again. The first one that I finished was the one that I was almost done with when I did my last Friday Reads video, and that was They by Kay Dick. I had picked this up because I'm into short books lately, which is kind of interesting, and I, I, I don't know if it will last <laughs> very long. Maybe now that I've named it, it'll go away. I don't know, but I'm really into shorter books right now, and this audio was like two, two and a half hours. So I was almost done with it when I did my last Friday Reads video. I am done with it now. It kind of has Halloween vibes, which is the other reason I sought it out, but like queer holiday vibes, which is fun. So it was published in 1977 and pretty much immediately forgotten. And it is a book about almost authoritarian control that's not actually named as authoritarian control. There are basically hordes of people known as the, they or them who viciously police 
what other people do and how they behave, and particularly things about around the arts and freedoms and things like that. It feels a little relevant to today's times, uh, but again, it was published in 1977, so it does feel like something that could be published right now. It is still relevant for this day and age. Um, the protagonist is genderless. Well, they're not genderless. They probably have a gender identity, obviously, but their gender identity is not named at any point in the book. So you could it could really go any different direction. And that is something else that makes it interesting. And that's probably something I wouldn't have noticed unless it had been pointed out to me in the blurb about the book. And that allows it to really play with, like it's mostly talking about art as something that is being censored, but it's their lives as well and their love, love interests. And the fact that you don't know the gender identity of the protagonist really kind of plays into that. So it's a really interesting book. I liked it, didn't love it, but it was perfect for the sort of Halloween vibe that I'm going for right now. And that was well suited to it. I'm gonna move the camera a little bit so you can get a little view of Jamie hanging out with me. And she's been doing really well this week, by the way. She is putting on more weight. She's healthy again. Uh, in about a week, we will have to check her kidney function again, I think. Uh, so continue keeping fingers crossed for her. But uh, yeah, she's been doing much, much better. Uh, so that was the first book that I finished. The next one that I finished was Lavender House by Lev A.C. Rosen. I was intrigued by this one for two reasons. First, Lev A.C. Rosen wrote Camp, which was a book that I read last year and really enjoyed. It's a YA novel, sort of like a rom-com that plays with uh, gender identity and outward performance of gender identity and gender roles uh, within the queer community, especially. especially. Uh, it's about a boy who goes to a camp for out kids every year, and he has been crushing on another boy, but the boy never notices him because that guy's a jock and is like mask for mask, that type of thing. So this summer, he decides to show up having completely changed his identity. He's gotten like a more masculine haircut. He's lowering his voice deliberately and is pretending to be a jock and he catches the interest of the guy. And it it's about that type of play, but it's also a cute little romance. Billy Porter is going to adapt it into a movie. I love it. I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about that, but that book is very much why Lavender House caught my attention. And then once I looked more closely, the other thing that caught my eye is that it is described in by I think a bookseller put a blurb on it that's described it as a queer knives out and I was like okay I'm here for that as well so I listened to, to this on audio and this is definitely a case where that description is kind of almost harms the reading experience because this is not a knives out it should have been described as more of like a queer Agatha Christie because Lavender House is actually taking itself seriously and it's taking a very slow approach to the mystery at the heart of the novel. Not like Knives Out. Knives Out is comedic in a lot of ways and it's kind of, it's clearly having fun with the concept and the format and all of the performances of the actors kind of lean into that and it moves very quickly. So I don't think that's what Lavender House is. It is an interesting book. Um, I think part of it is that I'm, not really in a space for like mystery thrillers right now. And the fact that this was not the one that I thought I was getting when I picked it up, maybe damaged the experience a little bit, not in a shallow way, but just that expectation that I this was gonna be like a fun book and a fast paced thing was not met at all. And that was a little frustrating because that's what I really wanted. It's a, it's a totally fun book. It's in a different way than Knives Out. But uh, so basically the premise is, Evander Mills was a police officer in San Francisco somewhere around the early 1950s. He is fired from the force because he is caught in the men's room of a gay bar performing a lewd act on a man. And he's immediately fired from the force. He has wanted to be a cop his whole life, so this is sort of devastating to him. And he is kind of borderline suicidal when a mystery falls into his lap. He's kind of working as a private eye, but he hasn't really gotten that career off the ground yet. A woman approaches him, and she has been in a lesbian relationship with another woman. And uh, they have created a house named Lavender House that is sort of like a safe space for queer people. 
where they can hide away from the world that will judge them for who they are, censor them for who they are, treat them badly or violently because of who they are, and they are allowed to be who they are. So they are the two matriarchs. One of them is now dead, and it's believed to be an accident, but the wife is not so sure, so she wants somebody to come in and have a look. And uh, they have a son who has a marriage to a woman, but he's actually with a man who lives with them in the house, and his wife is with a woman who lives in the house as well, and a lot of the people who work there are also part of the queer community, and because it is just as important to them to have a safe space, they will not sort of tell on uh, the people who live in the house, um, and or rat them out to the press for gossip or anything like that, because this family is part of like a soap fortune. So the, the detective goes in and uh, immediately settles on the idea that it was actually murder and not an accident, which means that somebody in this house committed murder and he solves it. And it, again, it's not a Knives Out. It's much more of like an Agatha Christie. I think it does a little too much to repeat the notion of like a safe space. And of course, chronologically, it plays with the idea of who these people would be and how firmly their identities would be developed they feel a little more modern in terms of perspective in how they identify as part of the queer community. But it's kind of a fantasy in that regard, so you can't really fault it for that. So it's a it's a fun book. It's a cute book. It was not what I thought I was getting when I picked it up, but it was a fine experience. And I would, re I would recommend it, especially if you're in more of a space for mystery thrillers right now. I just have not really been enjoying them lately, although historically I do enjoy a good mystery thriller. The next book that I finished was Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. This is something I've wanted to read for a really long time and never got around to. I got to it because for the Montana Book Company's reading challenge for 2022, which I'm kind of wrapping up. I only have, I think, nine more prompts to finish. One of them I had left was the young adult or middle grade winner of the Coretta Scott King Award. So I looked through and Brown Girl Dreaming was one of those winners. So I did it. I really liked it. So I actually didn't realize it was memoir until I picked it up. It, it is, And I did it on audio. And it's poems that tell the story of Jacqueline Woodson's childhood in the South and in New York during the Civil Rights era and how it was growing up in those two very different worlds uh, with different generations of people who have had very different experiences of race relations in the United States none very good and all of that it was very interesting and also her emergence as a writer and someone who wanted to be a writer and maybe thought that she could be a writer and that is all really interesting I really enjoyed the book I don't know that I have a whole lot of other stuff to say about it but not because I'm not enthusiastic about it I definitely liked it I would love to read more books by Jacqueline Woodson I do think at this point, it feels like everybody has already read Brown Girl Dreaming, and I'm the person who was catching up to it. So I would just say, if, like me, you had not read it, it is a good experience. And the audio was actually great, and Jacqueline Woodson did read it herself. It doesn't even sound like poetry when you're listening to it, which is interesting. So you might want to seek out um, a physical copy of the book if you're more into that part, but it is nice to hear all of the emphasis and tone that she herself puts into the text. And I, I really enjoyed it in that form. So I liked it, and I think a lot of other people would if they haven't gotten around to Brown Girl Dreaming yet. I feel like everybody else has, and I'm the one person who hadn't done it yet. So I really thought that's where the list of books that I was going to finish for the week was going to end because I finished Brown Girl Dreaming, I think, yesterday morning. And I did not expect to finish now in November, which was the physical book that I'm reading. I have this Franklin Library edition that's upside down. <laughs> I'm doing this for part of my Pulitzer Prize project now in November was the 1935 winner for the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this here because there will be a Pulitzer Prize deep dive coming of now in November. I really liked this book a lot. This is a book that had largely been forgotten and feels like it's starting to have a comeback because it also was just reprinted in a new edition with a beautiful cover. I'll put it up here. And Josephine Johnson is an author that people are sort of reevaluating as well. She published other books 
None of them were as much of a hit as Now in November. Certainly none of them were as awarded with prizes in the way that Now in November was. It was her first novel, and she is still to this day the youngest person to ever win a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. But her career kind of stalled after that. And in my Pulitzer Prize deep dive, we're going to talk a lot about why that may be. There are a lot of interesting things that go into that story. But I'm really glad that this book is being rediscovered and getting another shot at life because it is beautiful. This is definitely something that once I finish my project is going to be one of the surprises in there because I didn't really know anything about it when I started the project. It was something I was completely unfamiliar with. Uh, this one for sure, since Jamie left, I'm going to move this back up. Uh, this one for sure was something that was a little more obscure and I'm glad that people are finding it. It's a fantastic book. So it is set... During the Dust Bowl, the book never identifies the, that it is sort of a Dust Bowl story. I've seen people saying that it is a Dust Bowl novel, and I was thinking to myself, what's well, published in 1934, won the Pulitzer in 1935. How does that work timing-wise with the Dust Bowl? So it would have been written when the Dust Bowl was gearing up. The peak of the Dust Bowl was around when the book was published and won the Pulitzer. So it kind of latched onto that idea of like years of drought um, and the conditions that it would cause on a farm before it would have been a more popularly known or widely told story. Like the Grapes of Wrath would be years away at this point. So it kind of anticipated the direction that all of this was moving and got that story out almost in real time. And it's about a family on a farm and they've had several years to try to make a go of it. And the years have just been terrible in terms of the weather. And then this one year in particular does not go well. The protagonist of the book, who's the middle daughter of the family is telling the story in November, reflecting back on all of the things that have happened and it is a really beautiful and beautifully written book. I'm a huge fan of this. I can't wait to talk more about it in a Pulitzer Prize deep dive. I know Kim from Middle of the Book March also read this recently and loved it. So I can't wait to talk about this more. And I'm really excited about that. I had not anticipated that I would finish it. But the thing is, once you pick this book up, it goes very quickly. So I actually had 90 pages left when I picked it up before bed last night. And I just tore through them and ended up finishing the book. So I got another one in uh, that I could talk to you about in this Friday Reads video, and now I will start slowly working on my Pulitzer Prize deep dive for it. I've already done some of the basic stuff for it, but I, there are a lot of steps that go into it. And in my new approach to BookTube, I am not going to pressure myself to try to get it done quickly. So it will be coming. Stay tuned for more about that book. The other one that was a total surprise was that I was trying to think about what I was going to do as an audio next once I finished Brown Girl Dreaming. And at the end of the day, yesterday, I thought, well, Annie Erno just won the Nobel Prize for Literature. I'll put my reaction to her win down below. And I said I wanted to read one of her books. I have actually wanted to read one of her books for years. And when she won, I looked on Scribd and saw that there were a couple of her audios, but one in particular happening was the one that I was really interested in reading. And it was available. And it's only like an hour and a half. So I thought, well, I'll just pick that up. And then in the way of this week, I had much more time than I thought I would. <laughs> so I actually started the audio last night and then this morning I finished it. I didn't quite anticipate that being possible. And it's fantastic. It's a really good book. It made me even more happy that Annie Erno won the Nobel Prize for Literature because it's just, it's such a good and interesting book. And the way that it is written, I'm sorry, there's a cat that just disappeared. So Jamie's kind of growling, not whimpering in the background. And when Annie Erno won the Nobel Prize, a lot was said about her style of memoir and how she is a memoirist, but in a very different way than a lot of other people. And that definitely comes across in Happening because it feels like she's talking directly to the reader and she's kind of in real time as she's writing, reckoning with a lot of the details that she is sharing about this incident in her past. So this was published in 2000 or 2001. It is translated by Tanya Leslie. I should mention that, by the way. And in it, she is reflecting on something that happened to her 40 years in the past, somewhere in the early 60s, when she found herself pregnant and deciding that she wanted an abortion. 
And I will say, even at an hour and a half, her experience is very difficult to hear about at times. So if there are triggers that you have about this topic or about you know pregnancy and birth and any of that stuff, this could be a very difficult book for you, but it's fascinating. And I think well worth your time if you can stomach that portion of it, because the things that she goes through at that time when it was illegal to get an abortion, because she can't just like walk around looking for a doctor who will perform an abortion for her. She has to kind of in a very quiet and subtle way, try to find information about who can do this for her. And it's very dangerous. She ends up in the hospital. And so then in 2000, 2001, she decided to share her story probably having no idea that it would end up being so relevant in the United States 20 years later. And it's stunningly beautiful and honest and framed in a very interesting way. Again, it really feels like she's talking to you and reckoning with these issues in real time as she's trying to talk about them. And I would highly recommend it. Again, it's very difficult. And if you have these triggers, it's not going to be a book for you, but it's a fantastic book and it made me really eager to read more of her work in the future. So that was another unexpected thing that I managed to finish. Here are my plans going into the weekend. Now I had made a deal with Erica from The Broken Spine. When I did my most recent book shelf tour, I'll put a link to that down below as well, I mentioned that I had not read Jane Eyre. Erica was kind of appalled. So we made a deal that when I got back from vacation, we would make plans for a buddy read. So I got back from vacation. We talked about it. And we decided that November 1st, we are going to start. So this is something that I will be working on in November and it's coming. I'm not going to work on it this weekend. I'm going to instead put something really long and uh, perhaps time consuming. I don't know. We'll see once I get into it on my plate instead, because I really, really want to get into Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. So I'm going to. This year, I have been really good about reading one audiobook and one print book at a time. There have only been a couple of instances throughout the year where I've been doing more than one at a time, never on audio, but I have in physical. And I, I've really enjoyed that. So I don't want to make it a habit, but I think if, Assuming I'm not going to finish Demon Copperhead over the weekend, which I think is a reasonable assumption, I am going to be spending November balancing between both of these. That's why I felt the need to bring up Jane Eyre, even though it's not actually going to be the next physical book that I pick up and I'm not going to be starting it until next week. But uh, since the likelihood is that I'm not going to finish this chunky little friend <laughs> over the weekend, uh, I will probably be doing both of those at the same time. I'm really excited about this. I've had some good feedback from people who have already started or finished it, and I just am very much looking forward to diving in this weekend. So that's what I've been up to this week. I'd love to hear what you've been up to, what you've been reading, watching, loving, and let me know all of that in the comment section down below. Thank you again for all of your support, and I appreciate your time. I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.